is we should name we should name our 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 devices so that when we call you we call you by your name we don't want to see the name of the phone and uh, please if you want to ask any questions just go and do, uh, go to the reaction uh, part and just raise your hand and you'll be called and please 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 remember to mute your mic when you are not talking or the lecture is ongoing. And then please, we want to just make sure we have a useful and very, very um, participatory um, session today. Your questions we will have. Subsequently, when we finish, we would have feedback about the session ways to improve what you like best, what you don't like, we want to know about you. And then we will announce for the next month's session. So there we are. And I think on that note, on that note, I think I want to just invite our sport, uh, first speaker because she's a very, very busy person. Uh, she works in the private sector. So it was, was an up his task getting her to come and talk to us on this very, very special uh, topic. Like I have said, she's a doctor, she's a mother, she's a consultant physician, she's a fellow of the College of Physicians, and she's a gastroenterologist, which means her special specialty is on the liver. Uh, like I said, she works in the private sector and time is money. We don't want to keep her waiting. I want to invite her to please share her screen and uh, share with us on the overview of hepatitis and what we need to know about the global hepatitis day. Dr. Obioma Amnoneze, over to you. Uh, Lekon, can you stop sharing your screen? Lekon, stop sharing your screen. Okay. So please share your screen. Share your screen, Obioma. Or should we share your screen? Should we share your PowerPoint? It's okay, ma'am. I'm doing it now. Okay. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to the distinguished audience. And um, thank you for having me here today. My name is Dr. Anomnesi, and this afternoon I'll be taking you through an overview of hepatitis, and then I'll focus on World Hepatitis Day. And this will be my outline for the presentation. So um, let me start off by talking a bit about the liver. It's actually the second largest organ in the body that's just second to the skin. And as large as it is, it has 500 vital, more than 500 vital functions. Um, three of the major ones include its role in glucose metabolism. It's involved in synthesis of important body proteins, and it's also involved in the excretion of waste substances from this body. Understanding the functions of the liver actually has a role to play in how patients with hepatitis and other liver-related conditions present. So what exactly is hepatitis? So basically inflammation in general has to do with how the body responds to um, foreign objects or injurious substances and infections that in, try to invade the body's immune system. When that inflammation is um, affecting the liver, so that's what we call hepatitis. And it's caused by a variety of infectious as well as non infectious agents, which can lead to a range of health problems in the affected individual, and in some cases can actually be fatal. Understanding how exactly hepatitis occurs, how the infectious causes spread, how they are transmitted, how to reduce the transmission are actually the first steps in reducing its impact. And hepatitis is of global concern. We have um, about a million deaths per year caused by hepatitis B and C infections alone. In 2019, there was an estimated 78,000 deaths that were caught worldwide um, due to complications of the acute hepatitis A to E infections. And this doesn't even cover the chronic cases. 
In fact, we found from recent studies that have been done, it's shown that deaths from other infectious diseases, such as um, HIV and even tuberculosis, are actually declining mm -hmm. in our environment. Meanwhile, we'll have deaths from hepatitis, usually as a result of the complications, such as liver cancer and liver cirrhosis, are actually on the increase. And this is a major concern for us in this part of the world. So I mentioned the causes, I'm broadly grouped into the infectious as well as the non-infectious. Being that today is um, World Hepatitis Day, and um, it's focusing more on um, bringing awareness and reducing the impact of viral hepatitis. I'll be focusing more on the viruses, but just to look at the causes, we have viruses, the common um, hepatotrophic viruses like hepatitis A to E, then we have less common viruses like Episimplex, yellow fever, but I won't dwell too much on that. Um, it's important to know that there are actually other infectious causes of hepatitis. So you have parasites like schistosomiasis, you have bacteria like mycobacterium. We have um, candida, which is a type of fungi that can actually cause hepatitis. For the non-infectious causes, I'll focus a bit more on the just the, the two that are of um, global concern as well, in, in addition to the viral hepatitis. So you have the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as well as the alcoholic liver disease. Um, other um, non-infectious causes are shown on the slide. So the viral hepatitis, there are actually five types that affect, that cause diseases in human beings. There's actually a sixth type, which is um, hepatitis G, which doesn't typically cause diseases in um, humans. And then this, there's an outbreak of a new um, type of hepatitis in various countries across the world, like in United Kingdom, some parts of America, which don't seem to fall into the group of these five known types of hepatitis. And um, there are a few misconceptions about these um, hepatitis viruses. Some people feel that once you've had one, you can't have the other. They feel that some are a continuum of the others and that they basically are similar in terms of prevent, um, presentation. But these viruses actually differ in how they are transmitted from one individual to the other. They cause a wide um, variety of um, illnesses with hepatitis A and E typically causing an acute form of hepatitis while B, C and D, B and C especially causing um, chronic hepatitis. D typically can't occur in an individual that does not already have hepatitis B. They also define their dis geographical distribution with hepatitis C being more common in the Western world, um, while um, B is more common in Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa and other developing countries, as we know. Um, for prevention methods, understanding the different modes of um, transmission, um, it's easy to see why the um, prevention methods also differ for each of these viruses. So focusing now on the mode of transmission, which is quite important, like I mentioned, in preventing these viruses, as not all of them actually have vaccines that can be taken. So for hepatitis B, C, and D, um, it usually involves them um, coming in contact, exposure to infected blood or blood products, as well as um, certain body fluids, such as um, semen. So for the modes of transmission for B, C, and D, it involves exposure to blood or blood products, either through trans transfusions for the patients on um, regular hemodialysis, um, percutaneous and mucous membrane exposure, through unsafe sexual practices, and um, needle stick injuries, which applies more to us, um, the healthcare workers. You also have the vertical transmission, which is actually the main mode of transmission for hepatitis B in our environment, that is from mother to child. That's the maternofetal route, either during pregnancy, um, during delivery or even after pregnancy, after delivery, sorry. So we also have the horizontal transmission, which is from child to child. So the um, maternofetal and the child to child are the most common means of transmission for hepatitis B in our environment. For hepatitis A and E, um, it's um, different from the B, C and D viruses because this has to do mainly with um, hygiene having good hygiene, having good sanitation practices, because the modes of transmission are usually fecal oral or through ingestion of raw uncooked seafood or shellfish. So with the clinical presentation of hepatitis, there's, this all, there's another misconception about hepatitis that every patient with hepatitis usually has jaundice. That's a yellowish discoloration of the sclera, but that is actually um, wrong because the most patients with hepatitis are actually asymptomatic. They don't have any symptoms at all. And that is a major challenge for us in this um, part of the world because most of the patients, when they, they, they are not aware that they actually have the virus. And that's why 
with um, World Hepatitis Day and with every other day in practice, we emphasize screening. T go for the test. Don't wait for the symptoms to come on. Screen everyone everywhere because the average patient does not have symptoms. And most times when the patient already develops symptoms, it means that some of the complications such as liver cancer and liver cirrhosis have already set in for that patient. So you have patients presenting with things like um, abdominal pain, you could have usually in the right upper quadrant where the liver is located. They could have a localized swelling also in that region, or they could have a generalized abdominal swelling as shown in the image on the right. They could also present with their neuropsychiatric manifestations. That's for the patient with liver cirrhosis already, which we commonly refer to as hepatic encephalopathy. And um, I think it's also important to note, if you notice the second group of symptoms I mentioned is that they can actually be nonspecific. Looking at this cluster of symptoms, the first thing that might come to mind is that this patient living in Nigeria most likely has malaria. So we have a lot of patients coming in. They tell you that they've been screened for malaria up to five times in that year or in a period of six months, when in fact, because no one asked them to do a test for hepatitis, it was actually hepatitis they had. So the investigations for this patient, typically what we try to um, emphasize is screening the patient's asymptomatic or not. And the common ones we ask for are the hepatitis B surface antigen and the anti-HCV antibody. Those are the ones that we check for because those are the causes of um, chronic hepatitis. However, if a patient presents with acute symptoms or has a um, laboratory feature suggestive of an acute infection, then you may want to go ahead and check for the um, viral hepatitis that, cause, that presents with um, acute um, um, features such as hepatitis A, I, G, M, the anti HEV IgM. And if the patient is hepatitis B positive, then you can go ahead and check for the anti HDV antibody. Because, like I earlier said, hepatitis D virus can only occur in an individual that has already been infected with hepatitis B. So, other tests now depend on the findings of these assays. So, you want to go ahead and check for how much of the virus is there in the um, bodies, in the person's um, um, system. So, that's the quantification or viral load. Then you also want to check being viruses that affect the liver. You want to check for enzymes that typically are er elevated when there's something causing harm to the liver. So if this is elevated, it also increases the likelihood that this is what the patient has. And then you also want to check for the function. You want to check the excretory function of the liver by checking the bilirubin level. And then you want to talk up, talk, um, check the synthetic function of the liver by checking the international normalized ratio as well as the albumin. The alpha fetoprotein, being that um, liver cancer is one of the complications of um, hepatitis B and C, you also want to go ahead and have this test done. Abdominal imaging is very important. Um, one of the reasons why we do this for our patients is because first, you want to make sure that even this patient that is asymptomatic doesn't already have the complications of hepatitis, such as liver cancer and liver cirrhosis. And sometimes it's the abdominal imaging that is the first pointer to these complications. You also want to rule out other um, concomitant um, um, liver pathologies, such as a non-alcoholic fatty liver or fatty liver in general, either from non-alcoholic or alcoholic causes, because the management can also be affected. Then you, in addition to possibly starting um, antiviral therapy, you want to also emphasize healthy lifestyle and control of the likely um, predisposition in that patient. Other investigations involve um, testing for fibrosis and other tests such as HIV, which if present in a patient that has hepatitis B or C, actually affects or alters the choice of treatment in that patient. So other tests that might be important would be the kidney function test um, for two reasons, the hepatitis B and C viruses. Yes, the hepatitis viruses, but they do also cause complications in the kidneys as well. And then some of the medications used to treat these um, viral infections can also affect the kidneys. So in managing these patients, um, I usually like to start with counseling because you educate the infected Nigerian and you've basically educated several people. It is important to carry your patients along. Let them know what they have. Let them know what the, that uh, particular disease condition is all about. Let them know the complications. Let them know the importance of maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Let them know that long-term monitoring is important, not a one-off visit of, oh yes, you have the hepatitis B, you have the hepatitis C. You're, so I've had cases of patients saying that they were told that they are going to die because they were found to be hepatitis B positive. 
other aspect is the lackadaisical attitude of saying, oh, you have hepatitis B, we've done some tests, you don't need treatment, go in peace. So we have the two um, extremes of patients, the one that has been told that they are going to die and the one that has been told that all is well. Unfortunately, in the latter case, sometimes they come to us years down the line and they already have complications simply because they were not followed up because they were not carried along about the importance of long-term monitoring in their cases. Um, obviously, you also have to talk about the pharmacotherapy where eligible, because if for a patient with hepatitis C, there is a cure. Usually, the drugs are taken for about three to six months. And then for hepatitis B, there is no cure as of now, but there is a vaccine for prevention. And that is where counseling also comes in. So the patient has already been found to be infected. It's important for you to tell them to get their relatives tested, let their close contacts get tested, let their co-workers, their co-worshippers, anybody they know, let them get tested. And in the event of testing negative, it's important to emphasize the need for vaccination. So these are the complications I mentioned. There are other complications, but these are the ones that are of major concern. So that's um, cirrhosis, basically as a result of continuous insults of the virus on the liver. Over time, there's formation of scar tissue, um, which gives eventually there's a um, formation of regenerative nodules as shown in the image on the right. And over time, the function of the liver can be affected. For hepatocellular carcinoma, it's um, another deadly complication of hepatitis. And we don't even want any of our patients developing any of these complications in the first place. And that's why the, the um, issue of early screening, early treatment, access and affordability of the treatment cannot be overemphasized. So it will be a bit easier talking about the prevention because I've talked about the mode of transmission of these viruses. For A and E, we talked about the importance of strict hygiene, improved sanitation, because that's basically how you can get it if any of these um, factors are lacking. So you want to encourage frequent and vigorous hand washing, avoiding um, um, drinking um, untreated water, controlling and screening of food handlers. And of course, if anybody is found to be um, non-immune to hepatitis A, they can actually have the vaccination because when this um, virus occurs in adulthood, it can be quite um, problematic for some. For hepatitis B, based on the mode of transmission, you, you want to um, avoid sharing sharp objects, um, um, encourage and promote safe sexual practices, um, ensure um, extensive screening of blood before they are transfused. And of course, in the healthcare sector, use of disposable needles and syringes. And it's also important that every pregnant woman should register for antenatal care. And at this point in time, the hepatitis B and C screening test be carried out in them so that in the event of a baby being born to hepatitis B positive mother, that baby should receive both the active as well as the passive vaccination within 24 hours of birth. For hepatitis D, C and D, the mode of um, prevention is similar to B, but like I, added, like I added on the slide for hepatitis D, apart from um, preventing all the means of um, coming in contact, being exposed to the viruses, it's also important to prevent hepatitis B. So for someone that is not already infected in hepatitis B, it's important to get vaccinated. Um, I included a slide just to talk about the two other causes of hepatitis that are of global concern, and that's alcoholic liver disease. The main mode of prevention, we would say, avoid alcohol intake altogether. And if you must take alcohol, make sure you consume it within the safe limits as shown on the slide. For non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, when someone already diagnosed with diabetes, you want to ensure that the patient has adequate control and generally ensuring that the person has a healthy lifestyle. So these are other preventive measures for the other types of hepatitis, as well as for patients already known to have either a chronic hepatitis, you also want to take these other preventive measures into consideration. So I'll just go through a few myths that people have about hepatitis. So we have this um, issue of stigmatization when it comes to hepatitis B and C, whereby a patient that has been an individual found to be infected with the virus is giving their own cutlery, is giving their own bottle, their own cup to use in their houses. But um, so the myth is basically that um, pay, um, it can be contracted by kissing, by holding hands, by sharing eating utensils, that even mosquitoes can transmit the virus. After all, it's contact with infected blood. 
but that is actually wrong. Hepatitis B and C cannot be transmitted through any of these means. The other myth that I wanted to highlight is the fact that people think that hepatitis is genetic. No, yes, it can be transmitted from mother to child, but it is not true genetics at all. So um, if a person has hepatitis, they are either promiscuous or unfaithful to their spouses. We get this presentation a lot in our um, hospital, whereby a couple is already um, at, at um, odd ends, they are already fighting, accusing each other of being unfaithful. But if you recall, when I was talking about the mode of transmission, I said in our environment, hepatitis B is usually, is commonly transmitted in childhood, either through vertical, that's mother to child, or horizontal, that's child to child transmission. And there are several other myths that um, I've highlighted. There are several other more than this, but these are the ones I decided to share with you today. So I'll round up by one minute about, more. Okay, you are rounding up. Yeah. yeah so I'll round up by talking about World Hepatitis Day. For um, the theme for this year is bringing hepatitis care closer to the primary health care facilities and communities, so that people have better access to treatment and care, no matter what type of um, viral hepatitis they may have. In Nigeria, that would um, entail making available more affordable and accessible means of testing, treating, preventing, and the overall care of these patients. Um, I, and we hope that with all of that, we can achieve the WHO's um, aim, which is to eliminate hepatitis by 2030. Um, this is the um, theme for the World Hepatitis Alliance, which is um, similar to last year's theme for World Health Organization, which is that hepatitis can't wait. So let's not wait for the pregnant woman to get registered. Let's not wait for um, people on, on a of their status to get tested. Let decision makers act now to make hepatitis elimination a reality through political will and funding. So this will be my last slide, just emphasizing the fact that hepatitis can't wait. Everyone everywhere in this part of the world and other parts of the world need to get tested. And let's all work together to increase awareness about this very important virus. Let's work together to prevent complications in those already infected, and let's reduce the stigmatization that these patients are already experiencing. These are my references. Thank you so much for your active thank attention. You. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. We really appreciate this. And I can tell you, for those who cannot um, join us, uh, because some people seem to be having problems with the internet. I've been getting a lot of um, complaint on the platform. We're going to share your slide. If we have your permission, so everybody will have it. And I think that will take us quickly to Dr. Philip Oshu, who is uh, one of us. Uh, like I said earlier on, he's, um, he's a doctor, he's a clinical microbiologist, he's a virologist. Uh, he works at Lagos University Teaching Hospital, Idiaraba. He's an IPC specialist. He's gone through the course uh, that some of us are just starting. He's done the basic, intermediate, and the advanced course. So he's an IPC specialist, and he's going to take us through the IPC aspect of this hepatitis not just the, uh, the viruses alone, is going to touch a bit more on HIV. I give to you, Dr. Philip Oshu, you have the floor, sir. Can you please stop sharing your slide there, uh, Obioma? Thank you. Thank you so very much. But wait around because the questions are coming. Uh, note your questions and comments, so at the end, we'll take them all together. Dr. Oshu, um, over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Shawande. Um, Lekon, could you help me share my slide, please? Thank you, everyone. Um, today, I'll be presenting infection prevention and control considerations for blood-borne viruses and HIV. Uh, and um, as an introduction, the blood-borne viruses our viruses are present in human blood and cause disease in humans. There are many uh, blood-borne viruses, but the important ones we'll focus on today will be hepatitis, um, obviously because today is World Hepatitis Day, 
and of course HIV. Others would include Ebola, vi Ebola virus, um, Lassa virus, and that can also be uh, bloodborne viruses. Next. Next slide, please. So um, these viruses are viruses of public health importance. Um, just looking at these statistics shows us how important they are. Um, 38.4 million people living with HIV, um, about 600,000 people died. Um, and just last year, 1.5 million people acquired HIV. And the doctor has already told us about the statistics for hepatitis B and C. So uh, these are very important viruses. But today, we'll not be discussing the viruses. What we'll be discussing are the infection prevention and control um, considerations, especially in the healthcare settings. So we'll be limiting our discussions mainly to the healthcare setting. Next slide. So the bloodborne viruses, how are they transmitted? The transmission uh, of these bloodborne viruses are one through needle stick injuries, and this is one of the reasons why it's very important. A lot of um, healthcare workers um, have needle stick injuries, and so um, one of the some of the viruses that may be transmitted will be the HIV hepatitis virus. Other sharp injuries, lacerations um, from sharps that are contaminated, then contamination of mucous membranes with splashes, when there's splashes of blood, splashes of body fluid or sprays uh, during um, procedures on the ward and um, in the health patient settings. Then use of contaminated medical equipment, uh, different medical devices that we use, uh, especially the ones that are reusable. Once they, there's contamination with um, blood and uh, body fluids, then it's possible to transmit uh, these infections. And the big one uh, is the unsafe injection practices, unsafe injection practices. Then invasive medical uh, procedures, surgical procedures, then blood transfusion also, especially in um, low and middle income countries where people are given blood that may not have been screened properly or screened um, using uh, rapid kits that during emergencies. So blood transfusion could also be a source of um, a mode of transmission, sharing of needles and um, mother to child. Next slide. So how do we break, how do we break the chain of transmission? How do we do um, the preventive practices? Can you go back please? Go back. Can you go back? One, one go back. more, go back. Mm -mm, you're too fast. Just allow me to tell ah, you when wait, to wait, we wait. can see here. Yes. So we'll be looking at standard precautions. Um, these are the minimum standards for infection and prevention control practices in the healthcare setting. The principle is that we should assume that every blood and blood product or body fluid, sorry, of any patient could be infectious. That means they are potentially infectious. Any patient at all, that the blood and body fluids are potentially infectious. And it, it is supposed to be practiced by all healthcare workers, anybody that is delivering healthcare, doing care of all patients, all patients, not just some patients that we think uh, may be HIV infected or infected with hepatitis B because of the test that's been done, but all patients. It should also be at all times, whether it's in the morning, afternoon, or night, whatever shift you may be doing, and in all healthcare settings whether it's an inpatient on the ward, whether it's an outpatient in the clinic, if you're doing home care and you're delivering care at home, or even if you're in an ambulance and you're delivering care, it should be applied in all healthcare settings. Next slide. Next slide. And what are the components of standard precaution? Um, and hygiene, injection safety, sharp disposal, use of uh, personal protective equipment. So we'll be looking at these different um, components uh, further. 
Next slide. And we start with the uh, very uh, important one, hand hygiene. And these hands are, can be easily contaminated with um, blood and body fluids. And so hand hygiene so is the single most effective measure to reduce healthcare associated infection. Next slide. And how should we do hand hygiene? There are two methods. One is hand washing and the other is hand rub. So we should prefer to do hand rubbing using alcohol-based hand rub. Why? Because it is faster, it is more effective, it is better tolerated, and most importantly, it can be used, performed at the point of care, right at the point of care. That is where we want hand hygiene to be performed right at the point of care. And what is the point of care? That's where three elements come together, the patient, the healthcare worker, and the patient care activity. So that point of care is where um, the hand hygiene should be performed. If hands are visibly soiled, your hands are visibly dirty, or there's visible exposure to blood and body fluids, then you should use soap and water because um, the alcohol and drug will not penetrate dirt or organic matter very well. So you need to wash with soap and water when there's visible dirt or there's visible exposure to blood and body fluids. Indications of hand hygiene will be based on the five moments of hand hygiene, which we'll look at very soon. And the appropriate technique should be used and the appropriate timing. And we'll look at that. Next slide. So what are the five moments? Moment one, next, just press ones. Um, moment one is before touching the patient. And this we do to protect the patient from germs that the healthcare worker may be carrying on his or her hands or germs from the healthcare area. That's moment one, before touching a patient, such as when you want to take vital signs, do blood pressure, um, check the pulse rates and the respiratory rate. Next. This moment two is before aseptic procedure. Next. So before clean or aseptic procedure. And in, for this, you need to do is to protect um, the patient from germs that will be carried on the hands of the healthcare worker or from the healthcare area. And also germs from the patient himself. So if patient flora that gonna be on an intact skin, uh, you do not want to push that flora into a sterile site or a critical site where it can cause life-threatening infection. So we are protecting the patient from um, germs from the patient and also from the healthcare worker. Next. The third one is the after body fluid exposure risk. Once you have been exposed to body fluid, then you should do hand hygiene. This is to protect the healthcare worker and also the healthcare environment from harmful germs. So protection of the healthcare worker. Moment four is after touching a patient. And sorry, moment three will be after doing procedures like uh, lumbar puncture, um, wound dressing, um, functioning, insertion of um, endotracheal tube. Uh, those are different um, clean and aseptic procedures, even handling the bed urinal after a patient has uh, urinated in the urinal. Moment four is after touching a patient. Next. So after touching the patient, you also want to uh, do hand hygiene. This is to protect the healthcare worker and the um, healthcare environment so that you do not leave the patient zone with germs from the patient to the healthcare area. Next. And lastly is moment five, which is if after touching patient surroundings. So those who go into uh, the patient zone and collect um, materials from the patient's bedside, touch the bed rails or the IV stand, or lay the bed when the patient is not around. If for any reason they do not touch the patient at all, when leaving uh, the patient zone, they need to do hand hygiene because the patient zone is uh, full of the patient flora, and you don't want to take away the patient flora or patient germs into the healthcare environment. So this is to protect the healthcare worker and the healthcare environment. Next. So the next uh, slide will show us the um, technique and time duration 
or the different methods of hand hygiene. Next slide. So can you go back? Yes. So um, these are the steps to do hand rub, which is almost similar to do, doing hand washing. The hand rub will take um, 20 to 30 seconds and hand washing 40 to 60 seconds. After rinsing the hands, um, dry with a single use towel and use the towel to turn off the tap. So you should not use your hands that you have washed or um, rubbed to turn off the tap. So you should use a hand towel, sorry, a um, single use towel, which can be paper towel or cloth, which is uh, reusable. Next. So that is about hand hygiene. Next is the use of personal protective equipment. We mentioned already that um, a lot of times the, um, there could be splashes as part of the modes of transmission. There could be cuts and uh, lacerations. And so wearing um, personal protective equipment creates a barrier to prevent such uh, from happening. So to, do, to use PPE, which is the personal protective equipment, we need to perform a risk assessment to determine the risk of uh, transmission of infections or of uh, pathogens during different uh, procedures. So you need to look at the procedure that you are doing or the patient care activity and determine the risk of uh, transmission and the uh, routes of transmission. So um, the first one we'll discuss is gloves. So the gloves protect the hand. So any patient care activity that your hands will become exposed to blood and body fluid, then you need to wear gloves. And of course, for personal protective equipment, it's important you wear the right size uh, so that you can feel very comfortable. Then mask. Um, I'm sure a lot of us wear masks now because of COVID-19. Uh, for uh, blood-borne viruses is to protect the mucous membrane of the mouth and the nose from splashes of blood and body fluids. That's for blood-borne viruses. Because during some patient care activities, for example, a patient is bleeding or during suturing, blood can splash or be sprayed into the mucous membrane of the mouth and the nose. And so the mask would be able to act as a barrier to prevent that. Next, the gown or apron. When doing, um, especially when taking deliveries, um, blood and body fluid can splash. And so we protect these skin and um, clothing wearing gowns and apron. Then goggles to protect the mucous membranes of the eye during uh, procedures or patient care activities that may involve splashes. Um, also the face shield, the face shield can protect the face, the eyes, the mouth and the nose and all these mucous membranes can get, uh, can be infected with uh, blood and uh, body fluids. So these act as barriers to prevent transmission of this virus. Next slide. Then we've mentioned that um, one of the most important ways of um, transmission of blood-borne viruses is our needle stick injuries um, or safe uh, injection practices. So how do we make injection practices safe? So we should avoid medications. That's the first thing. If a patient does not need to have an injection, and the oral route is possible, then please give um, medications using the oral route once that is a possibility. And for those who start with IV fluids or IV injections, please convert to oral as soon as uh, possible. So medications that do not need to be given as injections, please give it orally. So that is that eliminates the risk completely. So if a person does not need to have an injection, you can eliminate um, on safe injection practice. So our uh, needle stick injury loss. Never re recap a needle. Please do not recap needles. Syringes are to be used once, single, one time. So please do not reuse um, syringes. Once needle, one syringe, only one time. So um, then you could also use sterile safety engineered NIP syringes. I will show you pictures of that later. Where withdrawing um, medications from um, vials. We should never leave the needle in the septum of the vial. Do not break 
needles, do not bend needles, and for no reason should you manipulate needles because that um, lead to risk of needle stick injury. Next slide. Anytime you're withdrawing or reconstituting a medication, always use sterile needle and syringe. Some people, what they do is to say, okay, I will change the needle, but I can still use the same syringe. No, always use a new syringe and a new needle. For multi-dose vials, it's as much as possible, uh, we prefer that you use single dose vials. If you use multi-dose vials, then it should be restricted to one patient. And if you must use it for multiple patients, then please use um, new needles and syringes. And it should not be kept around where a patient is. You should not keep it in any patient's zone because if you keep it close to one patient, then that um, multi-dose vial will be contaminated by patient flora or patient germs, and you can transfer that to um, another patient. So if you're going to use multi-dose vial, which we uh, advise against, it must be kept in a central place and not uh, by the patient bedside. Then uh, when there are bags of some people, when they want to mix medications, they have a, a common bag of normal saline where everybody goes, sticks in a needle and withdraws to go and mix medication. That is not good. So um, using a, a bag of intravenous food as a common source supply for multiple patients can also lead to infections with bloodborne virus. So please do not go for one uh, patient's uh, drip uh, to get um, normal saline to mix somebody else's medication. And do not, we, we investigated outbreaks in the neonatal world years ago, and we found that it was this common um, intravenous, bag of intravenous feed, normal saline uh, to be specific. That was, um, that was the source of infection for that outbreak because there were multiple patients, um, the healthcare workers were using the same um, uh, intravenous fluid to mix uh, or to flush patient line, multiple patients. Next slide. So these are safety engineered needles. Um, you can use the reuse prevention syringes. Those are, there are some that are automatic, immediately you would um, give the injection the needle just retracts into the syringe, into the, uh, the needle retracts into the syringe. So there are different uh, ways to uh, different technology, but the most important thing is that once the needle is used, the uh, device prevents you from reusing it. So that is one of the ways to, um, to improve uh, safe injection use. The other is, uh, the other, types of needles are syringes with sharp injury protection. So you can see that sheet um, on top, uh, the red or the orange sheet and the blue one. Once you given the injection or once you um, take in the venipuncture, then it's, it caps on its own, just um, self uh, capping. And so you just dispose the um, unit as one. So those are ways um, safety engineered uh, needles. We use um, prevention syringes and syringes with sharp injury prevention features or protection features. Next slide. So we also discuss um, sharps disposal. So how should we dispose sharp? One is that it is the duty of the person that is using the sharps to dispose the sharps. Please do not leave sharps for someone else to dispose. Don't do a procedure and just dump and leave all the sharps, the lancet, the needles, the syringes um, for someone else to come and dispose. Please, and that means that once you are doing a procedure, there should be a sharps disposal box, a sharp box or a sharps container close to the point of care where your hand can reach before you start the procedure so that immediately you finish, you discard the needle and the syringe or, the, or any sharps right into the sharp box. So it should be close to the point of care as possible so that you can have access to it. Then once it is three quarters full, it should be closed and sealed 
and um, send for incineration. So once it's to be cutter full, we should not be seeing um, sharps container that are full of uh, needles and syringes. And please do not dispose needles or sharps into the normal uh, with other wastes. Do not dispose them into the red bean, into the red bean bag, into the yellow bean bag, into the black bean bag, because that poses risk for those who are, especially those who are working in the environmental um, units that come to carry the wastes and dispose them into to the uh, sites of disposal. So it's very important that we do that and we are brothers keeper. Please do not dispose needles and sharps in, with other waste. They must be disposed into the sharps container. And uh, waste that contain body fluids uh, should be disposed into the infectious waste, which is the yellow bean bag, and the highly infectious waste, which is the red bean bag. Next slide. Then the other ways to prevent um, infection prevention and control practices would be decontamination of reusable medical devices. Reusable medical devices, reusable patient care equipment. Those ones that we need to clean and disinfect. Some of them we need to clean and disinfect, but we know that the principle is that for every disinfection or sterilization, the first step is to clean. No cleaning, no disinfection. No cleaning, no sterilization. Because the first thing is to remove the organic material, the dirt, and that you do by using, uh, by cleaning with soap and water or with enzymatic, enzymatic um, enzymes to clean. And so um, you should handle um, equipment that are soiled with um, blood and body fluids in a manner that prevents your skin and mucous membrane from coming in contact with that. And that means you should wear your personal protective equipment. And um, depending on the type of um, risk that you're exposed to, you should wear a gown uh, to once you are doing this kind of procedures to make sure that even your clothing do not get contaminated. Because if your clothing gets contaminated, you wear that clothing back home and can spread um, infections at home or even to, the, to other patients and the environment. So I would, would, um, if it's a single use medical device, please do not reprocess. Single use medical devices should be single use and discarded immediately after you. So we'll look at the um, next slide. To how do we determine whether we should disinfect or we should sterilize um, medical equipment? Um, just to go through, we have this Spalding classification: critical sites, semi-critical sites, and non-critical sites. Critical sites are areas where there's um, that are sterile. There is a sterile cavity, such as during surgery. If you want to enter into the peritoneal cavity, the pleural cavity, into the brain, those are sterile sites during surgery. So when you do a, when you do surgery, you are entering into sterile sites. So for the level of reprocessing, it must be sterilization. So that must be sterilization for critical sites. Semi-critical sites are sites that you come in contact with mucous membranes, such as the mucous membrane of the mouth, the nose, the vagina, the rectum, or the anus, sorry. So for that, you can do high level disinfection or sterilization, but high level disinfection can suffice. So it's not compulsory that it must be sterilization. And a lot of endoscopes that we use, flexible endoscopes that we use, we do high level uh, disinfection. The vagina speculum you can do high level disinfection. Then the non-critical are those um, devices that come in contact with intact skin. Uh, such as the stethoscope, the pulse oximeter. And for that, you just need uh, low level disinfection with um, alcohol, such as methylated spirit. Uh, so that will suffice for um, stethoscopes, which are non critical medical devices. So that this is what helps us to determine whether to disinfect or to sterilize. But like I said earlier, the first step is cleaning. And no cleaning, no disinfection, no cleaning. No sterilization. Next. Um, we we'll also do environmental cleaning. Um, I'll just go through this to say that we should clean and disinfect patient care areas, especially the frequently touched areas or the eye touch areas like the uh, bed, 
rails, the bed, the doorknobs, they are, those are very uh, areas that we touch uh, very frequently on the wall. Um, so those are areas that must be cleaned and disinfected um, daily, at least once daily, sometimes in every sheet, depending on the um, operate, standard operating procedure for environmental cleaning in your facility. Linen handling is also very important because linen can be contaminated with uh, infected blood and body fluids. So it's important that we handle soil linen and waste um, carefully with minimal um, manipulation or agitation uh, to prevent the risk of infection. Next. Then we'll just go through um, other preventive uh, practices that we could do um, that are not limited to the healthcare environment. Um, please, can you go back? That's not the end. We screen blood and blood products uh, for transition, screen them for HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Uh, we could also, next slide. No, the one after this. So we could also, give hepatitis B vaccination. So that is um, the main mode of prevention of hepatitis B. Since there's a vaccine available, so hepatitis B vaccination, and uh, it's important to check that um, the vaccine has, the vaccination has become immunization. That means you need to check for immunity to ensure that uh, the process of vaccination translates to immunization. Immunization means that the vaccine has now given the minimum required level of immunity to uh, the person. Then post-exposure prophylaxis are for HIV, we use antiretroviral drugs, especially for those who have needle stick injuries. Um, and for hepatitis B, uh, hepatitis B immune globulin, and also offer hepatitis B vaccination. The person is hepatitis B negative and has not received vaccination. Health education is also very important. Um, the last speaker has touched on health education, counseling the uh, patients on the routes of transmission and prevention of HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis B. So in summary, uh, blood-borne viruses, um, including HIV, hepatitis B, and C, um, can be transmitted through infected blood and body fluids. And to prevent this in the healthcare setting, standard precaution is very important. And what is standard precaution? It is assuming that every blood and blood put and body fluid of any patient is potentially infectious. So it applies to all patients in all healthcare settings and it should be practiced by all healthcare workers. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Shun. That was really loaded and I'm sure everybody's noting. Now, lastly, we want to invite um, our speaker from National Hospital uh, to share her screen. Are you sharing your screen or click on? Hello, oh yeah, query. She will share screen now. Okay. That was good very good, and I'm sure everybody has speak a word or two about that. Uh, whilst we are waiting for her to share her screen, uh, like I said before, so many people have a problem joining, but then we would uh, share the, uh, the recording and the slides for the people that have missed this very important session. So we are waiting for Ms. Inyokwere to share with us and then we'll discuss. We are waiting. Hello, is she on? Yes, she's on. It's waiting for her to share screen. Okay. Or maybe whilst we are waiting, if anybody has any one or two comments so that we don't waste the time. We want to manage time for, I think she's from, for Dr. Shu or Dr. Amnomneze 
as soon as she comes on, we will, uh, we will stop. Any comments, questions, or you type in the chat box. <laughs> Hello, please mute your mic. She having problem. Nico, maybe you should share so that we don't wait too much time. Okay, that's fine. Maybe you should maybe you should share because you know I think maybe she's having problems. Sorry for the breaking transmission. Wendu, are you there? Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the break. <clears throat> My name is Chiwendu Onyekwere. I'm an IPC nurse in National Hospital. I'm here to present the improvements in IPC practices in National Hospital. Next slide, Nicole. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. So this is a brief uh, view of National Hospital. The first uh, picture is showing the entrance of our National Hospital. Then immediately after the entrance is this huge wide building, our trauma center. And the next uh, building you see after is an emergency uh, block. There are other blocks, but these are the entrance uh, view of our National Hospital. And um, I'm proud to say that our National Hospital has approximately 436 bed capacity. Then a brief history of our um, IPC National Hospital. We were officially inaugurated on 25th April 2019. And we are under the microbiology department of National Hospital. Our IPC have, um, is headed by uh, Dr. Rebu. He's our IPC chairman. And we have other committee members. We have two, um, and the unit, the unit started with two nurses, but currently we have three certified um, IPC nurses here in National Hospital. Then the current state of IPC, the improvements we've done recently so far. <clears throat> um, first of all, on hand hygiene. Our last compliance wasn't that um, impressive. It was uh, approximately that 6% rate of our hand hygiene compliance in National Hospital, the problem is 36%. And after we got this um, percentage, which we are not happy with, we put one or two things in step to um, make sure that then make sure to make sure that we improve our rates in our next compliance. First of all, we had to make sure that there's availability of soap and alcohol-based hand drop in the hospital. And I'm proud to say that um, here in National Hospital, we have an in-house production of alcohol-based hand drop. So for a long time now, we've not been lacking alcohol-based hand drop because of the in-house production, and the production is really adequate. And recently, we started the production of soap, that's liquid soap for hand wash, but on a low scale. We've not really kick-started it on a very big scale, but our hand, hand, hand uh, alcohol-based hand drop, is really the production is really large to serve for the health. Um, um, another thing we did on the hand wash was um, that we had to liaise with the procurement department to make uh, our hand soap <laughs> available at all times. So when we don't produce hand, hand soap in our pharmacy department, we make sure that the procurement department is always there to support us. And we also have plans to, all, to upgrade this, uh, the production of our alcohol-based hand drop because we have the plans of putting at least a medium size bottle on each patient's bedside. That's on every point of care. So if a ward has a cis bed, um, a cis, a cis patient in a, in a, in a ward, 
um, we are planning to place the alcohol hand drop on each patient bed cupboard to make it easily accessible for the healthcare workers to use. And presently, as we speak, we are um, backing on um, uh, currently um, embarking on a um, hand hygiene surveillance <clears throat> and other compliance to know if all this put in place have really improved improved the compliance to hand hygiene. Next slide, please. Then on waste management, we the um, the IPC team of National Hospital have um, succeeded in putting trash bins around the hospital premises. Before now, we hadn't any trash bin around the hospital premises, especially in the quarters and the car parks. Trash have been uh, disposed randomly. But as we speak, we have trashes around the hospital premises and around the quarters and around the major corridors of the hospital for easily disposal of waste. Then we really introduced the use of sharp box and color-coded waste bin liners. Um, some time ago, we were lacking sharp boxes and uh, we noticed that uh, we weren't segregating our waste properly. But currently, we've reintroduced the use of the proper um, sharp boxes. We're no longer improvising. We have enough sharp boxes in our store for the work to requisite to use. And we have uh, implement, we've, um, reintroduced the um, color coded waste bin for proper waste segregation. Um, look on next slide so they can see the picture of what I'm talking about. Okay. Previously, it used to look like this. The nurses would get a carton, put a plaster around it, then make a hole for it. Yeah, it's an improvised when there's no sharp, then there's no proper sharp box. But this has um, one or two disadvantage um, associated with it. This um, plaster can go off at any time, and these cartons are not really that punch proof. Then this, this is what it looks like right now real sharp box now are now in place. Next slide, Liko. Liko. Okay. <clears throat> then uh, this is a picture from our bonds and plastic units. This is a sample of our color coded, coded uh, waste liners and our sharp box somewhere there. Then uh, close to it is uh, an IC, IIEC material, a poster that shows them which trash goes into which. We make sure that we place it close to the bin so that there won't be a mistake when um, disposing their waste so they'll get it correctly. Because if you put mistakenly put um, 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 a trash, a general trash into an infection waste trash, it has really disorganized the whole process. Next slide, Lee huh? Okay, so I'm proud to say that um, National Hospital has installed a new, a brown new incinerator, the, the one on blue by the right. Previously, before now, we've been having incinerator issue. Previously, we have two incinerator, one of um, 10 kg capacity, another one of 30 kg capacity, but the picture is not right here. I didn't really get a clear picture of the 30 kg capacity, 30 kg own. But this is a picture of a 10 kg we've been managing, and it breaks down frequently because of the um, overuse, because we don't only incinerate for national hospitals, incinerate for other hospitals around too. So I'm proud to say that we've installed uh, a new incinerator in national hospital that will help to you know to assist this the other ones. The next slide. Okay. So our current state in IPC, our current state of IPC in isolation ward. At the peak of um, the last uh, pandemic, at the peak of COVID, we renovated um, our isolation units to serve for our purposes. We, there was a repainting and changing of structures. Then uh, the, there was a installation of an automatic, aut automated doors in the isolation to control the flow of um, people, especially relatives in and out of the isolation unit. So only authorized people are the, that are allowed into the place. And um, they also installed um, an extractor fan that produces a positive pressure 
that, that produces a positive pressure into the room. So before you go into the room, you on the switch. The switch is located outside outside the room. You on the switch so that the extractor fan can act for some time before you enter. It creates a negative, sorry, a negative pressure room, not a positive pressure, sorry, a negative pressure to the room. And also there are new patient monitors and a dedicated dialysis machine to the, there's also a dedicated dialysis uh, room and, a, and two dialysis machines that are dedicated to the isolation room. Next slide. Oh, so, okay, this is how, there, this is a picture of our uh, isolation uh, world, how it looks like. It's a single room, how it looks like. Then this is a picture of our dialysis um, room. Is um, strictly dedicated to the isolation room. If you look closely above the nurse's head, you will see. If you look closely above the nurse's head, you see the extractor fan that generates a negative pressure to all the rooms in the isolation room. Next slide. So another improvement uh, is um, the creation of. Um, a molecular lab. We have um, a world-class molecular lab in our hospital that has various equipment. This molecular lab is situated at the basement, just uh, above our isolation, um, just above our isolation ward for easy accessibility. Yeah, they have um, over here. They have machines for chemistry. These tools are for chemistry. One uses uses, uses cartridge. This other one uses um, reagents. We have um, somewhere here, we have um, water, um, water um, distil um, distiller that distillizes water with UV rays and other equipment also in here. <clears throat> Next slide. Okay, so this is our COVID tent. Is close to the isolation room in an open field behind the isolation room. This shows the inner view of the tent. This is the outer view of the tent. The tent is solely for COVID testing. Here, we do our rapid tests using rapid kits to test um, both staff and outsiders for COVID-19 tests. And we have dedicated staff to dedicated staff that work in the tent also. So anybody that wants to do a rapid test comes here to do their rapid test. Then the state of our laundry. Our laundry currently we had to reopen our unidirectional flow. There was um, a door, two, two doors actually for in and out flow of of dirty and cleaning. But one door was closed to control traffic but um, when the unit had to go there to re-educate them on the use of the two flow on the unidirectional flow, so that they're coming in, detonating is coming in from a, a private a, a one flow, while the cleaning is going out from another flow, we had to educate them why it should be so. And we also noticed that they were using uh, um, their trolleys um, randomly, just like that. So we had to make them dedicate a separate group of trolley to one to clean linen, while the other um, trolley to dirty linen, collection of dirty linen. And we had to educate them on how to keep the linens clean so that they won't contaminate um, the linen. The, so they won't contaminate the linen. Still on um, the IPC, in, in the IPC state, we embarked on the health educating the workers on some IPC measures to control infection. I had to, I have to educate them on proper wearing of nose masks so that they won't contaminate the nose masks on the process of wearing it. I had to educate um, health workers, so especially the environmental um, the potters on how to dilute their sodium hypochloride for cleaning the surfaces and the floors and other IPC measures soon. Then replacements, still on health education, we have, um, we had to re replace the old um, materials, the old posters, the old IEC materials on the wall, replace them, replace the worn out ones, put fresh ones. 
um, and also check places that need um, fresh icing material, those that didn't have before had to put icing material close to them. These are all measures to help educate our healthcare workers and visitors on proper IPC measures. Next slide, please. So on our hydro department, our hydro department, um, I'm proud to say that we have a water treatment plant that treats our water. A major source of our water is from the FCT water board. But we have to, apart from that, we have, a, we have two standby boreholes in case there's shortage of water in the state so we can generate our own water. So if the FCT water board is not on, we pump our own water through our own borehole. Then we'll do our own in-house water treatments. Our capacity, um, reservoir capacity is um, approximately 350,000 cubic meter. Then we treat with chlorine and liquid alum. We treat um, and wash our tanks um, once every year. And this, but this treatment is being done like monthly Every month, the tank is being filled up and treated before they start disposing it, they start generating it out to the hospital to use. The full next slide shows a, a view of our hydro, next slide please, a view of our hydro department. This is what the treatment plants, yeah, too fast, go back. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you have this, to run talk so that you know we okay. can take questions. Okay, this okay, is what I'll just, Yes, thank you Look, very much. Next, next slide. I'm, I'm almost done. I meant to yeah, slide. Thank you. thank you. Okay, the introduction of the contamination of the world instead of fumigation, because fumigation doesn't really work. So we had to tell them um, the contamination is what, the contamination of surface is what works now. And we we appointed um, one link nurse link not per ward for easy communication of from um, the world to IPC units. Next slide. Next slide. So the challenges we had was, um, we noticed that the health care worker has, um, 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 has replaced hand hygiene with hand gloves. Once they're wearing hand gloves, they feel they are protected. So we had to tell them that despite the fact they're using hand gloves, you have to still do hand hygiene after removal of hand gloves. Then difficulty in maintenance of positive behavior among health workers is like a human factor. It's always difficult to influence a human to change their behavior towards anything. Then once in a while, we usually have financial constraints to in purchasing of um, IPC items. Then there is equally a breach in chain supply when it comes to the procurement department. So that the supply have not brought it, or the procurement department have not really um, requested for fresh supply. Then this regular breakdown of our incinerator. But with the new incinerator, I pray that a new incinerator solve this problem. They won't won't have problems of incinerator again. So in conclusion, the IPC Unit of National Hospital we are really doing a great job in the back in, in combating infection in the hospital and in our premises and our surroundings. And yeah, we still have more work to do. So all hands should be, will be on deck till we get to our summits, we get to our limits. So we get to our limit of um, reducing infection in our hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, um, Chimwendo, Perry. This is really fantastic. We want to thank you for at least sharing this with us. And I'm sure people are picking some points. Now, uh, I know the time is fast spent, but we'll take care of some few questions uh, so that we can, the experts can respond. Um, any questions? Can you put up your hand quickly so that we can take questions so that we can round up for the day? I know we didn't start on the doctor too, but we want to try and keep to time. Any questions? Questions? Uh, I've seen uh, two hands up. Uh, Sally Sue Inua, followed by Abimbola Adesanya. Can, can we quickly have those two? Sally Sue? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, that is impressive for, for National Hospital. I. 
I have just a few questions to ask. Uh, like the, the final uh, uh, slide that she mentioned that she has problem with the use of gloves that is taking uh, hand hygiene away. Okay. Does she have any, any, any intervention in that aspect? So if she has, what intervention has she actually placed for, for, for that to, 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 to remind the staff? And then for, for IPC items, because of financial constraint, what are the items that she feels, okay, uh, uh, these are the items that, that are not being secured in, in place, procured in place. And then- yeah, but you what, know, she may not be able to go into details because of her time, okay. but oh, you know, okay, she's not in it. So, yeah, okay. So, so what, the, what the current of rate of infection for uh, healthcare associated infection in the hospital, in that same hospital. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I've been well at this time. Yes, ma. Ma, my question is actually concerning the hepatitis B, based okay. on the fact that it's a major um, issue, especially um, when it comes to disease transmission for health workers. And presently, um, hepatitis B is not free on the vaccine list for adults. I know okay. it's available for children, but it's not readily available for adults. And even coning it down to health workers, can the IPC program or body move for hepatitis B vaccines to be readily available so that health workers can protect themselves? Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Unyekwere, do you want to take the National Hospital? Can you put up your hand? Okay. Can you take the national house to questions first? Are you there? But maybe I can take the hepatitis B because I was actually at a meeting this morning. We were at a government, um, uh, one government agency and another NGO raised money. Right now, there is no policy in Nigeria to vaccinate all healthcare workers. That is where advocacy we have to go on. But we're advocating that, you know, at least medical students, nursing school, environmental health officers should be vaccinated aside from what is a cost. But one good news I want to tell you. I belong to Ina Will and we purchase some from them. Uh, the company we went to said they have a thousand staff, but we cannot afford to do just like you are saying, but we just do the first 20. So until we have pockets like that, we continue to push for it, but it is um, it's money. But it's basically should be the, should be government. But we try and do, we try, everybody will try and do their own little bits wherever we find ourselves. Thank you. Um, are you ready? Q and do. I don't know whether she's on. I hope she hasn't left. I think she has some internet problems because uh, we had to share her slide. Ma, sorry, I went off the line. Okay. Okay, did you hear the question? Yes, about- uh, Do you hear your age, uh, hospital acquired infection? Do you have the rate for your hospital? Or are you planning to do a study? And the, the supplies, what exactly are the challenges you have? Okay, for the hospital acquired infection rate, we are currently on it. Okay. Yes. Then for um, hand gloves replacing um, hand hygiene, how we go about it is that we do a unit um, as we go around for our environmental surveillance every day. We do uh, a small cluster health education to the nurses or, or the doctors. We capture them in ward rounds where in a large group, in a smaller group. Or so we have to um, health educate them on the spot. We don't wait till we call a large conference of, um, of a training. We do our health education every day to tell them that despite the fact they wearing of your hand gloves every day. So I pray there will um there will be an improvement in change. So when it comes so the next question is about 
supplies or saying something about supplies, specific well, supplies. But you know, I I don't even want you to say that online. I think it's something they can privately get in touch with you with because every hospital has their own private um, challenges. Uh, I well, just want uh, to announce that you should know that- a, a manager, everybody in Nigeria, we're all managers. Exactly. We have to manage ways um, we, exactly. we don't always use um if it's if exactly. it's stained. You can exactly. call it provide can equally improvise with all based hand drops. We have a lot of things to improvise with. If you don't have an apron. Where her internet is breaking. But please note, go to the chat box and do the feedback. The, the feedback link is there. Make sure you feel uh, can the equally improvise. On a punch up in bottles. So, you know, we Nigerians, everybody here is. Yeah. There is nowhere that everything is perfect, but we are all yes. working towards yes. a goal. Yeah. Exactly. She's breaking up. She's breaking up. Palisu, I hope you, you gather, you, we, 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 we will link yeah. you up. Th thank uh, you, ma. Oh, That's impressive yes, from her. Thank yes, you so yes, much. Yes, you did well. Thank yes. you. Our internet is not very good. Uh, please remember to do the feedback. Uh, go to the link and uh, give us your feedback. And um, we know today has been a lot of challenges. Some people couldn't join. Uh, we know there is power issues, there is internet issues, but then we are still forging on. We are very resilient people. We continue to forge ahead. But we are hoping to come back next month, like I said at the beginning. I want to thank you all very much for creating time today with us. And I hope we've been able to at least whet your appetite to come up and to see that if there is a will, there is always a way. There is always a way of going around. You either go around your problems or over it or under it, or you can always solve it if there is a will. So please, can you fill the feedback form and then hopefully next, Next month, last Thursday of the month, we'll come back to you. We try and uh, get back as soon as we can, as soon as we clear with the facilitators. We try and improve. So please, please don't forget to do the feedback. Thank you very much, and God bless you. I'll see you next month. Thank you.